Greetings. Greetings and welcome. I want to thank everybody for coming out today for our last Humanities Forum lecture of this fall semester. You should watch the Dresher Center website soon, I think, for an announcement about the spring Dresher Center uh, Humanities Forum lectures. I am really happy to introduce today's speaker, who is my history department colleague and my department chair, Marjolaine Kars. <laughs> Professor Kars has been at UMBC since 1994, when she came to us from her PhD at Duke University. She is a leading scholar of early American history, broadly defined. Early America meaning, as it now does for many of us, the broader Atlantic world that included North America, Latin America, Western Europe, and not just England, France, and Spain, and, and Africa. And her first book, Breaking Loose Together, The Regulator Rebellion in Pre-Revolutionary Pre North Carolina, appeared in 2002. She's now working on a book called Freedom Marooned, An Atlantic Slave Rebellion in the Early Modern Dutch Caribbean, from which today's talk is a part. Professor Kars has held a number of prestigious fellowships, including a full year NEH fellowship, and she has had several fellowships from our own Drescher Center for the Humanities. Her work has, has appeared in important journals and books, and I am really thrilled to tell you, as I'm sure she is too, that uh, she has an article forthcoming this February, this coming February, in the American Historical Review, which can only be described as the flagship journal for the entire study of history, not just American history, not just any one part kind of history. Um, so this is a huge accomplishment. It's also significant that Dr. Carr's has made contributions that extend well beyond her outstanding scholarship and teaching. She has been involved for many years with K-12 history education in Maryland, including as a co-writer of our successful Teaching American History grant, as a presenter of many programs for K-12 teachers, and as a co-writer and historical consultant for the iPad app, Children's Lives in Colonial London Town. She served on numerous professional committees for our discipline, including as chair of the James A. Rawley Book Prize Committee for the American Historical Association. And for those of you who've not been on book prize committees, this involves reading pretty much all books that are nominated for a prize in a particular field. It is a major uh, obligation. It's a major contribution to our profession. Here at UMBC, she is a just simply superb chair of the history department, which I know well both as her colleague in the department and as dean of the college. Uh, now in her second term, she is also a mentor to other chairs as well as a leader and an exemplar within the history department. Like all of the best historians, Mario Lane Cars knows how to find a good story, how to tell it well, and how to explain why it matters. And so I am delighted to introduce my colleague, Professor Mario Lane Cars, who will talk with us about Freedom Marooned and Atlantic Slave Rebellion in the Dutch Caribbean. I have a feeling that uh, Dean Casper introduced the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming at this incredibly busy time of the semester. I really, really appreciate that. I also want to thank the Dresser Center for making me a fellow and for inviting me to share this work in progress today. Um, and I really want to do three things. I want to introduce the project and Berbis, which is a place that you've probably never heard about. Um, I want to tell the story of the rebellion, which is indeed a good story. And I want to talk a little bit about what that story means and what it means for the study of slavery and rebellion and the larger Atlantic world. Now, after I finished that first book on the regulators, which dealt with a little bit with the American Revolution, I was in the National Archives in the Netherlands looking for um, my next topic. And I stumbled upon the records of this massive slave rebellion in a place called Berbis, uh, where close to 5,000 enslaved people had engaged in rebellion for more than a year. Now, I had never heard of this rebellion, and it turns out neither had anybody else. Uh, Berbis has been hardly studied. There's virtually no secondary literature, and only two books really mentioned this rebellion. One was published in 1770, and one in 1888, and they're both in Dutch. Uh, 
Now you might say, if it was such an important rebellion, how come nobody has written about it? Well, part of the reason is that Dutch historians have been much more interested in the East Indies, particularly Indonesia, just a much more exciting place. And non-Dutch scholars have not been able to read the records because they're all in Dutch. Now, once I started looking at these records, I realized that the Burby slave rebellion was in fact unusual for a number of reasons. One is the duration. You might not realize it, but almost all major slave rebellions that you may have heard about were suppressed in a day, two days. They were really over in the blink of an eye. There are a couple of exceptions. There was a slave rebellion in Jamaica in 1760. That was a series of rebellions and conspiracies that lasted almost a year. And of course, the major rebellion in 1791 in Saint-Domingue, which led to the Haitian Revolution and then the first independent black uh, republic in the New World. But most of them are really, really short. And this one lasted more than a year. Secondly, for this rebellion, we have amazing records. Um, this is an image of the governor, the Dutch governor, who started keeping a day book as soon as the rebellion broke out. And I think I transcribed it into 400 single spaced pages on my computer. We have voluminous correspondence by officials and military officers and soldiers. And the most wonderful of all is I have 900 examinations, as the Dutch called it, of slaves taken as the rebellion wound down. These are interrogations and witness statements. A surprisingly rare source, actually, a very wonderful source, and also a fairly problematic one, as I'm sure you can imagine. But I was attracted to this rebellion, not just for its scope and its relative obscurity, but also because these amazing records allow me to do something different. Historians have studied Atlantic slave rebellions primarily in terms of the master-slave relationship. And they've done that in two ways. They have focused on male slave rebels military fight with slave masters. And they have assumed that slave rebellions were about ending the system of slavery and obtaining freedom. Scholars have been led to these emphases, both by European archives that focus on how these rebellions were suppressed, and by a pervasive attachment to liberal notions of individual choice that have permeated Western thought since the Enlightenment. Instead, I use the voluminous records from Berbice to map the internal dynamics of the rebellion, in addition to chronicling rebel interactions with the Dutch colonists and their Amerindian allies. The strength of this story is really in the, the details. If there is a, an historical project where God is in the details applies, I think it's this one, because it's really a close study that plots step by step what a slave rebellion looks like in a remote, isolated, riverine world surrounded by jungle and natives. My study plots aspirations, frustrations, ineptitude, and powerlessness on all sides. The master-slave narrative really doesn't play out here as it does in most rebellions. Now let me start by situating ourselves a little bit. I have a, I think a, the area I'm talking about is now part of the Republic of Guyana in northern South America. Um, the Dutch had a number of colonies there in the 17th and 18th century. Suriname, Berbice, Demerari, and Essequibo. Um, there were, um, and they were built, uh, the colonies were built along these rivers that extended like fingers into South America. Then as now, there were no roads. Everybody lived along these rivers so that they could get their goods to the Atlantic Ocean and then to Europe. Um, and in fact, even nowadays, this is the highway to Brazil from Georgetown. So it's still a place where everybody uses tent boats in the 18th century, rowed by slaves so that white people could sit under the uh, awning and not get too sunny. And nowadays, people still use canoes, which are hand-built, most of them. These were pictures I took when I was there a number of years ago. And you can see both how 
uh, lush it is on the sides and how people still m use these to get around. And um, the river is surrounded by vast savannas and rainforest, which are the home of, were the home of Carib and Arawak Indians who had been allied with the Dutch since the late 17th century and who controlled a vast hinterland where they exchanged Native American slaves for European goods. These colonies, these riverine colonies, these fingers extending into the uh, uh, South American continent are places of shaky sovereignty because Dutch power really doesn't extend much here you see a picture of all these forests, and there I touched something by mistake. <laughs> um, oh, and now it appears stuck. Huh. Can, is there still somebody? Ah. So this is an 18th century map of Berbiz, and you can see here, this is the Berbiz River. This is the Kanji River, it's tributary, and the plantations start about 40 miles upriver. Here there's too much tidal difference. And they really snake like a little ribbon right on both sides of the river and here on the Kanji River. And beyond that is all savanna and rainforest, where the Dutch really have no control. And as a consequence, these, uh, Dutch power is constantly contested in these places by Amerindians, by European competitors, by Maroons, as uh, runaway slaves are called, who form their own independent villages in the hinterlands, and by enslaved people fighting their enslavement. On the eve of the rebellion, Berbice is owned by a private company called the Company of Berbice. There are about 5,000 enslaved people living on these plantations. Um, 11 of these plantations are company plantations and they're larger, like 125 people maybe, and they grow, where people grow sugar. The rest of the 120, 130 plantations are in private hands um, and they grow mostly cocoa and um, uh, coffee. Um, there are probably 300 Native American slaves in Berbice and only about 350 Europeans live there and only about half of them are actually Dutch. The, re the rest are French and Swiss and Germans and others. In the 10 years before the rebellion breaks out, Berbice is in the throes of deadly epidemics of yellow fever and dysentery, which kills free and enslaved people alike. And then the Seven Years' War breaks out in 1755, and that retards the arrival of supply ships. So increasingly, enslaved people are hungry. And so in the years before the rebellion starts, sickness and starvation increasingly pit resentful and hungry laborers against hard-driving planters and overseers, eager to recoup their losses. The rebellion itself begins on a Sunday, as rebellions inevitably do, and the end of, fe of uh, February in 1763. Uh, it starts on six plantations, they are located right around here. That's where the main fort is. Locate the, the plantations are here. Re rebellion breaks out and the rebe rebels immediately make known that they are rebelling because of bad treatment and not getting what is our due, by which they mean fee food and stuff to drink. Um, the rebellion spreads super fast, mostly because the Dutch authority utterly collapses. The Europeans completely panic because they are vastly outnumbered. They spend their time burying their val valuables and then they race off to the fort here, Fort Nassau, or they make their way uh, west to the neighboring colony of Demerara. Um, about 70 colon colonists who are uh, closed off by the rebellion here from reaching the fort congregate on this big plantation called Pereboom where at the end of the week, the rebels massacre about 40 Europeans and then panic is complete. And so in the second week of the rebellion, the Dutch decide they can't possibly hang on at Fort Nassau. And what they do is, and this is a picture of Fort Nassau, looking better than I think it actually did. <laughs> and on a modern map, Fort Nassau is here. They go about the 60 miles back to the, back to the ocean where they hole up in this little dinkity fort called St. Andries. They're there for about a month and then a hundred soldiers arrive from Suriname 
sent because the Surinamese government is very afraid that the rebellion will spread to them. And with those reinforcements, the Dutch governor feels powerful enough that he goes back up river and he digs in in this southernmost company plantation called Dageraad. And he has no clue that he's going to be there for the next 15 months. For the rebels, the utter collapse of Dutch authority means that the rebellion succeeds, I think, beyond their wildest imaginations. And it allows them to create a revolution rather than a breakout on a few plantations. From the beginning, the rebellion consists of a coalition of people, though the dominant force were the Amina, as the Dutch called uh, people from the Gold Coast. I have a map right here. People of, from the Gold Coast, modern-day Ghana and its hinterland. Um, and the Amina, they were also called the Akan, and the English knew them as the Koraman uh, team. Um, as they were known, were behind many New World slave rebellions as the result of the particular political and cultural experiences that they brought from their homeland into the diaspora. So male leaders and growing forces, and I have a nice picture of a Coromantine fighter here, male leaders and their growing forces move from plantation to plantation uh, to, uh, to assess support, to diffuse opposition, to requisition supplies, and to conscript new soldiers. They burn down many plantations unless they want to keep them in production or they want to use them as rebel camps. They also burn some of the slave quarters of resisting slaves. And they organize themselves politically. The self-styled uh, leader of the governor, who calls himself Governor Coffey, who's a highly assimilated Amina, organizes a civil government appointing councilman, prosecutor, and executioner. And his second in command, Captain Akara, organizes the army, appointing officers and handing out guns to soldiers. They also appoint new masters on company plantations um, so that, uh, who, can, who, is, who are going to oversee the continued production of sugar and rum. The rebels also branch out to the Kenji River, that tributary that I showed you, where they strengthen themselves with additional people and supplies. And they try to make contact with um, uh, enslaved people in neighboring Demerara and with the Maroons in Suriname. But that, for various reasons, does not work out. In the spring and summer uh, of 1763, rebels and Europeans warily eye each other, both kind of stuck in this now topsy-turvy world. The Dutch really only control two plantations, this one up here and Dageraad, where they're where they're pinned. Um, they are reinforced with another 200 mercenaries from a Dutch island in the Caribbean. But these men immediately begin to fall ill from yellow fever um, and dysentery. And so the epidemic continues, further reducing Dutch numbers. The Dutch are very um, concerned that they get their Native American allies to close off the northern portion of the colony, because they're very afraid that the rebels will disappear into the jungle. And then should the Dutch ever get their colony back, there will be nobody to do the work. Um, but it's not easy to get the Indians to move into place, because Indians, even though they're allies, move on their own timetable and according to their own strategic interests. And so in addition to that, the Dutch are increasingly not only afraid of the rebels, but of their own sailors and soldiers, who are mercenaries, who signed up for bounties. But instead of fighting rebels, they're fighting disease. They're dying like flies. They're poorly fed. They're poorly clothed. And in fact, a regiment of soldiers sent to the border between Berbis and Suriname mutinies. Because in the absence of slaves to do a lot of the support work for the army, they feel, as they put it, that they're being treated like slaves. They mutiny, and they end up joining the very rebels they had come to defeat. And so the Dutch are really too weak to defeat the rebels. They're barely hanging on by their fingernails. They are waiting for reinforcements from Europe, which they think will come any moment. And the Dutch governor's writing home saying, things are not well here. We have as much to fear from within as from without. 
So the Dutch are very in a very precarious position, and to the extent that we're used to thinking of European empires as invincible, we're clearly looking at a very weak colonial force here. The rebels, in the meantime, control pretty much the entire colony. Uh, they regularly win small skirmishes with the Dutch, but when they have two major pushes to attack the Dageraad and get rid of the Dutch, they can't win because Dutch artillery is too much for them. And so the rebels can't really push the Dutch out. They have enormous logistical issues. Um, they can't disappear into the bush. You're probably wondering, why don't they just leave? But you can't feed thousands of people in the jungle. You need to start gardens. Um, it's the middle of the rainy season. You can't start uh, gardens uh, in the savannas and the forests when they're flooded. And besides, gardens take a good year or two to really start producing. They're running out of guns and ammo. Uh, and unlike the Dutch, they don't have the kind of Atlantic reach that allows them to be resupplied. And they know that any day uh, the Indians are going to be closing off the colony. And so in July, the rebel governor begins written negotiations. Now, written negotiations between slave rebels and slave masters are not entirely unusual, but they're pretty unusual. And I have about 12 or 14 letters that they exchange back and forth. Um, and not only are these uh, letters an amazingly valuable source, but Governor Coffey makes an incredibly bold suggestion. He says to the Dutch, let's divide the colony in two. You keep the bottom half. Oh, oh what did I do now? Um, you keep the bottom half, <laughs> closer to the Atlantic Ocean, and I will keep the upper part of the Berbis. Um, thank you. Now, the Dutch have no intention of, of doing that. Um, but they do enter into the negotiations because they want to gain time. They're still waiting for those reinforcements from Holland. And so the negotiations stretch out over about a six-week period, uh, but in the end they're unsuccessful. The rebels realize at some point that the Dutch are not negotiating go in good faith. And moreover, the rebels themselves um, are very divided over negotiating. Uh, Coffee and many, uh, and many of his Creole supporters want to negotiate, but many of the Africans trust more in guns than in words. And in fact, by the early fall, Governor Coffey's coalition falls apart. Um, there's a coup against him. Uh, he has to commit a ritualized suicide. And while the Amina stay in, uh, in charge, a, m uh, a man who has recently arrived from Africa named Atta takes over. <coughs> in November, then, finally, the first reinforcements from the Netherlands arrive. And with those couple of hundred people, the Dutch decide that they can't attack the Berbice too difficult. But they do uh, sail up the Kanji River, expecting to fight rebels. But in fact, the rebels kind of melt before them and force everybody who's still living on that river to retreat to the Berbice, where they're trying to consolidate their forces. Um, increasingly now, the Amina leadership are being challenged by other nations, other ethnic groups, especially the Kanga, who are people from this area up here, and by West Central Africans, particularly Luangos and Congo. And it means that the rebellion is increasingly dissolving into a civil war. And former slaves are increasingly becoming refugees, moving from camp to camp, from plantation to plantation, looking for food, um, while the rebels themselves are embroiled in conflict with each other. It's not until January 1st of 1764, so that's almost a year after this rebellion has broken out, that the main body of 600 soldiers from Europe finally arrive. And again, the Dutch decide that they're not going to um, engage in a big expedition because by now, formerly enslaved people are returning to the Dutch, a couple of thousands of them uh, by the end of March, uh, choosing re-enslavement over starvation and civil war. And the Dutch are afraid that if they have a big expedition against them, these people will no longer want to come back. So they have these little expeditions. This is a, an image 
um, of uh, uh, European soldiers in these wet forests not being very happy and not doing very well. Um, and so small patrols of Europeans and their Native American allies hunt down rebels who continue to fight each other as, as much as they fight the Dutch. Several prominent rebel leaders defect to the Dutch and become rebel catchers, bringing in hundreds of people. Um, and in March, the Dutch start their examinations, uh, it, both interrogations and taking witness statements, from these 900 people that I showed you before, generating, generating this um, amazing, if problematic, archive. Um, and even though the Dutch ask very narrow questions, it's a very revealing archive. And I'll get back to that. The Dutch are primarily interested in three issues, arson, theft, and what they call Christian murder. They begin executing people in March. They execute some in April, some in June, the last ones in December. 130 people altogether who are uh, burned at the stake, hanged, or broken on the rack. And this is a famous image by William Blake of somebody being broken on the rack. By summer, the Dutch are back in shaky control of their very battered colony. Now by now you're probably thinking, OK, so this is a very long rebellion. It has some great heart of darkness qualities to it. Uh, and it makes for a cool story, but is it all that unusual? I think that when we dig a little deeper, putting together evidence from what people assert in these examinations, from reports from Native American spies, from what European mutineers allege who live with the rebels for months, um, and from the observation of Dutch officials and soldiers, we, begin, we, be, we can begin to look more inside the rebellion. And I think that changes our picture. The rebellion looks united. But in fact, people are not all united. And they're certainly not all equally involved or committed. Now, that's not so surprising. Armed rebellion is very dangerous. It privileges younger men who can fight over everybody else. People are eager to protect their own possessions and those of their own masters from the rebels. Um, and there is likely some dislike and distrust of the Amina and their plans to uh, establish a new coercive labor regime in a state with themselves on top. And there is a lot of coercion which is not surprising because once you start a rebellion, which takes enormous courage, you better win it or you're going to end up like that. Right? And so the rebels encourage and force men to come along and fight. They force company slaves to work under new masters, doing the same old thing they had always done, growing sugar and making rum. Some people become personal servants or slaves to rebel leaders in keeping with West African and, and European customs that elite men and women be attended by servants and slaves. And others, especially women, are forced to work in rebel gardens to grow food. Given all this, I argue, quite a few people, in fact, become what I have called dodgers. They hide in the woods behind their plantations when anybody comes near dodging all combatants, and then moving back when the coast is clear. Now, hiding from the rebels, though, did not necessarily mean that these people supported Dutch slavery, nor did it necessarily signal only a refusal to participate in rebellion. Likely, for many, it was as much a statement about their own preferences for living without masters, a, a declaration of independence, if you want, by hiding Former slaves, in fact, became maroons in their own backyards, living independently of the Dutch and the rebels in their own communities, near their gardens and plantation food supplies to the extent that those still existed. The alternative, this alternative may have been preferable, especially for women, children, and the less able-bodied, to joining a military and violent rebellion. Take, for instance, a plantation named Poslust. This is an older map, so it's not on here, but Poslust is, uh, is very high up the river. And when the rebellion breaks out, the 18 enslaved people who live there have tough choices to make. Their owners want to run off to Demerara, and they want to bring their slaves with them. And the enslaved people say, no, no, we're not going to do that. 
uh, the rebels want them to behead their owners, and they're saying, no, we're not going to do that either. Instead, they're urging their owners to go to Demerara. They even carry their luggage for them, <laughs> part of the way. And then they return, um, having explained to their owners that, why would we go with you? We have always had a good life on this plantation. We have nice gardens. We don't want to leave. And if the bad people come, we'll, we'll, um, we'll defeat them. And then with the owners gone, the workforce on Boslust is essentially free. And for a while, they continue to live on their plantation, occasionally hiding in the bush when anybody comes near. Um, but they don't enjoy that freedom for long. The Amina come and take them upriver and force them to work on provision, uh, provision grounds, which are, are high up on the Berbice River, where Carib Indians kill half of them in a battle in December. Uh, after that, the remainders are captured by the Congo, uh, a, 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 a rebel faction. Uh, and in the end, six adults and one child only survive. This glimpse suggests that Bon people were happy to be rid of their Dutch masters and then to tend their gardens in peace. And the arrival of the rebels meant that they got dragged into the rebellion or it, spell, it spelled slavery all over again. Others, not so much dodge, but they vacillate, they change positions and loyalty, sometimes repeatedly, when survival demands it. In short, not outright rebellion, but avoidance, uh, along with limited resistance, outright or strategic accommodation, and reluctant cooperation vis-a-vis -vis the Dutch and the rebels, uh, characterize the actions of many black Berbicians. And so rebellion brings to the surface latent tensions and inequalities that no doubt existed in the black community in Berbice before 1763. I wouldn't know because there's no secondary literature. Um, and that shaped the insurgency itself. These are divisions of class. The same men who are the elite on plantations before the rebellion, like drivers, are the ones who are in charge after the rebellion, or during the rebellion, I should say, when the Dutch are gone. There are obvious divisions of ethnicity, as I've already explained. It's not clear how deep those ethnic uh, divisions go before the rebellion, but the rebellion certainly magnifies them. There are divisions based on uh, birth origin, Africans and Creoles, Creoles being people who are born in the colony. There's a lot of conflict between them, and Native American spies make clear that Creoles are largely forced into the rebellion with force. <coughs> and then there are the gender politics of rebellion. The leadership of the rebellion is mostly male. There are some women counselors. They're almost all related, or in fact, all related to male rebel leaders. But basically, women had many fewer opportunities for political participation and for increased status and new identities than men did in this rebellion. Women sustained the rebellion not as soldiers, but through their productive and reproductive labor. Some of that was voluntary, and some of it was not. In terms of productive labor, African definitions of labor demanded that women were in charge of food production, food foraging, food preparation. It's likely that the majority of women working in the fields uh, under the rebels were women uh, because men would have been set to soldiering. And of course, women were in charge of childcare. Women, uh, we learn um, from these records, become spoils of war in men's competition for status. Men competed for women to carry out these foraging and tending functions for them um, as servants and as wives. Prominent rebels took multiple wives, sort of restoring the polygamy that had been really important in West Africa and that had not been possible um, on European plantations, at least not for very many of them. And so women's productive and reproductive capacities become constituent components of rebel power. And as an emancipatory process, armed insurrection is decidedly gendered and fostered the subordination of women to men. Um, so where does this 
bottom-up picture of the rebellion leaves us. What are the larger lessons we can draw from it? Um, there are many, and I just want to highlight a few for you today. Um, historians tend to treat slave rebellions in a separate historiographical corner. You know, they, they're, they're, they're as if they're sui generis, so to speak. Um, they're rarely compared to other rebellions. But I wouldn't be surprised if many of you by now are thinking that the dynamics of the Berbice Rebellion are a lot like the dynamics of other large rebellions that we give grander names, say the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution. And so I want to talk a little bit about that comparison to the American Revolution, because that's the one with which I'm most familiar. In the American Revolution, too, coercion played a very important role, a role that historians of late are um, in increasingly chronicling. Secondly, in the American Revolution, also large numbers of people were neither, co neither committed patriots nor loyalists. In fact, we now think that three-fifths of the population, um, three-fifths of all Americans, as one historian uh, put it, fought to remain neutral in the War of Independence, skeptical that the leaders of the revolution could bring them the economic democracy and autonomy that they were after. Ordinary people and their leaders had different definitions of what freedom and independence meant, just as in Berbice. And like the Dodgers in the Berbice rebellions, these neutrals or disaffected people, as we call them in the American Revolution, have been little studied, in part because of how historians <coughs> have framed both the American Revolution and slave rebellions by emphasizing human freedom as the righteous goal of both the American Revolution and slave rebellions, we have turned the people who tried to stay out of the fray into morally suspect people who aren't worthy of being studied. And that emphasis has led us to prioritize vertical relationships between the colonized and the British, or between slaves and their masters, over horizontal ones, the relationships among colonists or the relationships among the enslaved. We have privileged, to put it in very old terms, the contest over home rule over the struggle over who would rule at home. Historians have been averse to seeing inequalities and conflicts among rebels, whether they be American rebels or slave rebels, in our eagerness to affirm unity in fighting for universalized understandings of freedom that were highly manufactured. As a result, we have cut ourselves off from grasping the aspirations and the politics of the majority of people caught up in these major upheavals. And in the process, we have sheared revolutions and slave rebellions, and by now you may also be convinced that maybe they're similar, of their moral complexities. And so, in short, and this is in conclusion, attention to the internal politics of rebellion brings dodgers and women out of the shadows, because we're not just looking at male fighters and male leaders. It complicates any facile equation of agency with resistance. It reveals that collective slave resistance was not necessarily anti-slavery. And just as importantly, the Berbice Rebellion, which was so much lengthier and so much better documented than most, exposes the tensions and fissures and inequalities that were present in 18th century Caribbean slave communities and shows how profoundly those characteristics shaped insurgency. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions of any kind. Surely. Um. 
Did the rebels have any contact with the Maroons in Suriname? They, um, what we learn is that apparently they debated it, um, but they never succeeded. And I think that is in part because um, Suriname is far, uh, and the Maroons, uh, as soon as the rebellion breaks out, the governor in uh, uh, Suriname, when he hears about it, sends uh, emissaries to the Maroons and says, this big thing is happening in Berbice. Don't get involved in it, please. You're on our side. Remember, we have just signed treaties in uh, 1760. It so happens they had concluded treaties. And according to those treaties, you're supposed to be on our side. Um, I have uh, not looked in the Suriname records to see whether I can find anything about how the Surinamese Maroons feel about it. But I wouldn't be surprised if they were not super keen on having a lot of competition. So I think that both their treaties with the Dutch as well as their own strategic interests would not have induced them to help the Berbice uh, Maroons, I mean the Berbice rebels. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the, uh, the interrogations, uh, what kind of questions were asked mm -hmm. and what warranted an execution? Yeah, the, um, the Dutch have a process uh, uh, that is, um, you make up all the questions beforehand, and no matter how people answer them, you keep going down the list, <laughs> pretty much. Because you're really only interested in those three things. Christian murder, an amazing term, I think. Christian murder, theft, and arson. And the Dutch being Dutch, they are eager to punish the ringleaders, but they don't want to kill too many people, because it's very expensive. <laughs> and so, um, then uh, enslaved people talk about violence perpetrated among themselves. The Dutch are totally uninterested. Uh, when they talk about what happened in the rebellion, if it did not involve arson or Christian murder, the Dutch are uninterested. And it means that often people tell amazing stories, and the next question is, OK, di so did you see any arson? I mean, <laughs> very frustrating. Um, it's unclear to what extent people were tortured. Um, this is, after all, a rebellion that lasts 14, 15 months. And that means that um, an enormous amount of stuff has happened. And a lot of stuff has happened among the enslaved. And so I think it, that many people who pretty much everybody knew were major leaders, they don't even try to lie. They, they from the beginning say, yeah, I was a major leader. You know, now I'm your slave again, but one day I, I, was, I was really a big guy. Um, they may contest particular murders that are put on them, they, but, but they're not pretending that they didn't do it. Um, there are a, a lot of people who say, well, I wasn't really involved. Um, uh, and then when they're questioned a second time, they're usually like, okay, well, I know so-and-so said, told you what I did, and it's indeed true, I did do that. Um, and I think the fact that they think it's a good defense to say I was forced or I didn't want to do it is in fact in part an indication that that, that happened a lot. Because when there's that many people around who are, who are all hearing what you're saying, if you're just completely making it up out of whole cloth, um, it wouldn't work. Um, and so these interrogations are sometimes uh, longer, sometimes frustratingly short. Uh, women tend to be questioned uh, less uh, than men are. Um, but they are really an incredibly rich resource. And I have big spreadsheets because I can often, when people talk about something, find it in another interrogation where somebody also mentioned it. So a woman can say, you know, my dad sold me to the rebels as a, 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 as a wife. And then I, and, and the rebel's name was whatever. And then later I find his interrogation and he goes, well, and then I bought his wife. Um, so they don't always jive. And it's sometimes really hard to know what time period our people are talking about. But they're, they're really fascinating. At the same time, you know, people are talking for their lives in these things. And so even though I have a feeling that people realize what kind of things will get you into hot water with the Dutch and what will not. Nobody is just comfortably sitting there and talking about what happened. So they're highly strategic, they're carefully crafted, and for me they're highly mediated because the clerk writes them in Dutch, they're in the third person. Uh, sometimes the clerk will say he had many other interesting things to say but they don't matter to us. <laughs>
um, you know, or they'll say, you know, he tried every which way to get out of it. He related a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, but for many, um, you know, m m much of what we know about slave rebellions actually comes from conspiracies. Which never, which never took place. And so when people talk about what happened, you have no idea whether they're sucking it out of their thumb or maybe it did happen. But, but here, so many people were involved that you can actually com that you can compare them and, and see how they drive together. And that's what makes this an unusual source. Whereas in the Haitian Revolution, similarly a long rebellion, the rebels win. So there are no interrogations, thank God, at the end. But, you know, so that makes their beast pretty rare. Hmm? Yeah. So I had heard stories about Kathy taking the bride of, or taking the mistress of the house as a wife. So I wondered if you came across that or if then you. Yes, yes. There, uh, you know, despite Western Europeans always to have these amazing worries that if there's a slave rebellion, the rebels are going to go after the white women, there's no indication of that in Berbis at all, except that Kathy marries the. 22-year-old daughter of one of Berbice's officials. Mm -hmm. He also marries a Native American woman. We know that he has several women of African descent. So I don't know whether he's trying to build sort of coalitions. Um, but that is the only woman about whom we know that. And she remains with the rebels for months. She finally, at some point she escapes, they catch her again. And then she finally, in January or so, um, escapes permanently and the governor says I had a long interview with her she told us many particulars <laughs> <laughs> and that's it um, but the mutineers who live with the rebels talk a little bit about her um, uh, so that and she was attended by uh, two younger women who um, girls 12 year olds so because she was coffee's wife she had to have attendance and uh, those girls are at Coffey's death, sacrificed on his grave, along with several Africans and some other Europeans. Mm -hmm. But there, so there's only that one account of a European woman who, who becomes a wife. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about how there uh, wasn't necessarily a large amount of secondary sources on the uh, matter. Um, I was just wondering what pieces of evidence were the things that led you to s sort of looking for um, this extensive amount of information that you end up finding? Um, well, I, I'm not sure this is what you mean, but when I went to the archives in The Hague, um, I came across this place called Berbis. I'd never heard of it, I must admit. And then I, it said something like, you know, records about a slave rebellion, 60 linear feet or something. <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> and it was the 1760s, which apparently I have a thing for. And it was about rebellion, which apparently I have a thing for. So um, I, I decided that once I poked around and realized nobody had really written about this and that it was an unusual rebellion, I decided that I would work on it. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, uh, just sort of methodological. Yeah, it, I hate to say it, but I kind of stumbled upon it. There was a question over there, yeah? Yes. Uh, do you believe the lack of record keeping encompasses this rebellion? As Lauren do you with the Dutch wanting to save face or just incompetence among the record Um Well, actually, there are a lot of records. Um, I, I, I don't think there, I think the Dutch kept a lot, in fact, uh, almost more than I know what to do with. Um, and I have a feeling that there are probably, and I have found also some stuff in the Surinamese records, and I have found some stuff in the correspondence of the governors of Essequibo, Essequibo and Demerara. Um, there are stuff in newspapers all over the, the Atlantic world. There's, m there's really more than, than I can handle, to tell you the truth. Um, Maybe what you mean is when the Dutch say he, he told many particulars and I'm not even going to mention it. I think that's because their judiciary process is so focused. They're not interested in how the rebellion started or what they were after. The Dutch are pretty, they're pretty, um, uh, how shall I say it, matter of fact about it. Uh, um, they talk a lot about if I were enslaved, I'd want to be free. So yeah, of course people are going to rebel when they have the chance. What they want to do is punish the three things they're upset about. Buildings being burned, so property being destructed, Europeans being murdered, and, uh, and stuff being stolen. 
and they really don't ask questions about anything else. It's different in that respect from a conspiracy and from an English judicial process where they ask much more wide questions. Of course, if they had done that, I would never finish that book, but. <laughs> Derek. Well, do, you, do you get a sense from the records of an effort among the folks who were rebelling to uh, sort of push past the ethnic distinctions and try to create sort of a, a racial or, or a slave identity? In other words, are they, are they trying to create a group of people who all share the same circumstances, non-ethnicity, who are backing the rebellion, or are they, are they just sort of group the rebellion in that thing? I think that they do that at first. I think that uh, that these nations, which are very you know prominent in the literature of South America, right, where people adhere to these um, ethnic designations that are really diasporic creations, they don't exist like that in West Africa. But people who have languages and broad cultural uh, perspectives fit together in these nations. I I think that that under the pressure of the rebellion itself. And we see that in modern wars too, ethnic differences which until then had not been so great become more prominent. And in part, I think when the rebellion is organized, men organize both by plantation and across plantation along nation lines, the lines of nation. And so each of these men you know, want to be important, want to play a prominent role. And then when discord begins over, it takes a long time, people are hungry, it's not working out, and uh, the negotiations people feel really conflicted about, then I think people that these ethnic differences become sharper, become stronger, and begin to rip what had been a more unified rebellion apart. I think Coffey and Akara tried very hard in the beginning. Um, but, but we, we repeatedly see that all the way up to the present, right? That, that, that in war and rebellion, differences that people could live with before then all of a sudden uh, become really important. Amy. Um, I wanted to talk, or have you talk a little bit more about your ambitious decision to compare this to the American Revolution, <laughs> and, and put, uh, which I think is fabulous, and to put the, the two in perspective. And you know, why do we call some things rebellions and some things revolutions, right? The, of course, in, in Britain, they didn't call the American Revolution a revolution. They called it a rebellion, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about your decision? Um, yeah, I, I have not quite decided how far I'm going to take that comparison in the book or where exactly I'm, I'm going to bring it out. But I was, I was really struck by it, in part because I was initially a, a scholar of the American Revolution. And so as a neo-progressive historian, um, I was really into this idea of rebellion within a rebellion. And there is a war of independence. And then there is a, a war among the Americans with elites wanting to stay in place and ordinary people saying, this is not the kind of independence that we want. And then I saw this very similar dynamic in Berbice. And it made me realize that, and I hate to sound ahistorical, but there is this is not an unusual dynamic in rebellions, whether you want to call it a rebellion or a revolution. And in fact, the Dutch governor calls it a revolution from the beginning. He almost never calls it a rebellion. He calls it the revolution. Um, and so in, in terms of that distinction, I, I think you've put your finger on it. Rebellions that we have thought were legitimate and that we have chosen to celebrate become revolutions. And um, uprisings that and insurgencies that we consider not legitimate become rebellions which is partly why I want to take slave rebellions sort of out of that ghetto, if I can call it that, where they're sort of treated by themselves as if they have nothing in common with other rebellions, be they big national ones or farmers' rebellions or um, peasant rebellions. Um, I, I, I think that we do need to see these all as more related. And, um, and maybe that's also a little bit the uh, uh, many-headed Hydra notion uh, that there are numerous ways in which European exploitation in the Atlantic in the early modern world is resisted by mutinying soldiers, by rebel slaves, by, um, uh, by sailors, by you name it, uh, by colonists, uh, even by elite men. <laughs>
clearly. So, um, so I do want to do something with it. I thought here, since I knew there would be a fair number of students, some of in my own class, <coughs> that talking about the revolution might also resonate. But, but I do want to do something with that, uh, because I have a bit of a mission there. Yes, Jen. Yeah, um, you have a lot of great themes that you're talking about for your books. So I was just curious, you might not notice yet, um, how you might break this up in your book. Do you know <coughs> how it's going to be organized by theme or chronological? Well, most of the book is written, uh, nine of 11 chapters. Um, so, uh, uh, but you know, the, the proof is, all, the, I mean, the, the the meat is always at the last little bit somehow, right? Um, I'm, I'm writing this as an exciting story. Um, and I'm weaving my analysis into it. And so I'm organizing it by and large chronologically. I start with a rebellion that happens actually as much smaller one in July of 1762, which completely scares the Dickens out of the Dutch. And I think gives enslaved people a good <coughs> idea both of how possible rebellion might be and how dangerous it is. Then I talk a little bit about Berbice, and then, then, I, then I just follow the rebellion chronologically. Not entirely chronologically. I mean, I'm obviously trying to look for certain themes, and I'm following certain people in each chapter. Um, but there is a, a, a broad chronological story to it, so that um, hopefully it, it will appeal to students, and it may appeal to some people who don't normally uh, read history, so I don't hit people over the head with historiography um, or so, but I, I do make arguments, uh, or, or I hope I do. <laughs> um, and so some of this stuff about revolution may, may, may end up, I don't know, at the end or the beginning or both. Yeah. Scott and then Constantine, and then we should probably break. <laughs> so where do the native people fit into this story? I mean, it sounds as though they're sort of on the, on the margins geographically of this river rebellion or revolution. And do they come in and out of the story? They do. They come in and out of the story. And, and I already had so much to tell that I had trouble fitting them in as well. Um, they come in in a number of ways. A number of enslaved Native Americans join the rebels. A number of enslaved Native Americans are among the Dodgers. Um, some uh, natives living in independent little groups sometimes help the rebels. The more powerful Carib Indians are a lot like the Iroquois. They just want to, I think, really protect their own monopoly position vis-a-vis -vis Europeans. Um, and they have a vested interest in slavery themselves because their main thing that they trade is native slaves. I mean, this really is a place where everybody is involved with slavery, either as an enslaved person or as somebody who's enslaving. And so um, it's particularly the governor of neighboring Essequibo, who has really good relationships with these Carib Indians, who does most of the negotiation, negotiating with them about, you know, let me give you arms. What do you need? We really need you to go to Berbice, you know. Um, and then some of them come from the Surinamese side. and. Um, I think for Native Americans, too, they don't want thousands of people living in the woods as Maroons. They tend to compete with Maroons. Maroons tend to steal Native women. Um, they compete for the same resources. So I think that they have a number of reasons, <coughs> besides treaties, their own reasons for not wanting to see this rebellion succeed. Um, again, because of the absence of secondary literature, there is not a lot written about um, Native Americans or uh, Amerindians, as they're called in South America, in this area. There's some wonderful work by an anthropologist who became very interested in um, uh, um, uh, poisoning and sort of uh, nefarious spiritual practices among Native Americans uh, in this area in the Amazon and died of a very mysterious disease, really young, Neil Whitehead. Uh, but he's the only one, and he worked in Dutch archives, but, but I think he didn't always get the story right. And so, in fact, I want my next project is going to be about the slave trade on the Wild Coast and, and Native people's slavery, their involvement in the trade, but also I have magnificent resources about these Native slaves and how they lived on plantations. <coughs> 
Um, and I'm also excited because that will mean going to look at Spanish records in Sevilla and Portuguese records in Lisbon. <laughs> I'm branching out beyond North Carolina. L last one, maybe, do you mind if I go call on the student? Or student, maybe? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned that you found some things in newspaper, European newspapers, so I was wondering if you took a look at the bigger picture and how the Dutch government in Holland, um, how important this, what was happening in this location was to them compared to what was happening globally at that time? Well, I think the reason it takes so long for these Dutch troops to arrive is because in Holland they can't decide who's going to pay for it. <laughs> um, uh, because after all, Berbice is owned by a private company with the stamp of approval of the Dutch Estates General, which is the Dutch government, <coughs> but it's private investors. They're now saying, uh, you know, we, we, need you, we need your help, we need you to pay for it. And so the Dutch government says, show us all your account books. Show us that you have, in fact, sent enough white people over there. Show us that you have sent enough soldiers. Well, that takes months. And it's only at the end they go, OK, well, all right, then I guess we'll, we'll send troops. Then it takes a long time to get the troops together, because they don't want to send one regiment. They want to take some people from all different regiments. And in fact, this becomes the nucleus of what becomes the Dutch Marines. Uh, and so it, and then they have bad weather, and then they have bad wind, and so it takes forever. So I think for the Dutch, this is not hugely important. They're worried about it spreading. And certainly, they get urgent letters from the governors in colonies nearby saying, if you don't do something, th this, could, this could also happen to us. And Suriname is, in fact, a rich colony and important, and we don't want that one to go down. Um, help arrives more quickly from the English, in fact. Uh, which is very interesting. The Dutch ask for help from Barbados, uh, and um, the Berbice governor is worried about doing that because the English have always been enemies. But uh, in Essequibo, they have no such compunction, and, and they're quicker about sending troops. Um, but they just send them to Essequibo, and, and it's not very much. So I think for the Dutch, this is not hugely important. But in the end, they do decide it's worth sending 600 or 800 in all, all told, 800 soldiers. And it costs them almost a million guilders. And they never get that money back from the company of Berbies. They don't know that, of course, when they, when they do it. But um, so, well, thank you all so very much.